Hello, everybody. Welcome to Talk Now Radio, uh, listener-supported radio where no topic is taboo. And, of course, I'm brought to you by Revolution Radio, which is also listener-supported radio. And that's where no inform- where information never sleeps. Pardon me. I'd like to take a quick moment before the show starts to remind everybody that being listener-supported means rather than get our uh, support from, ab- uh, well, the big advertising companies that can always come in and say we... If you do this here topic, we're going to censor, or we're not, they're going to censor you by not wanting to, you know, advertise on your site. Uh, We do use like Google ads and affiliate programs, at least I do personally, but I'm not sure about Mike and Revolution Radio, what all they use, but it's not the same thing. They're different types. What I am getting at, though, is it means that we have to be supported by you if we're going to grow and do better, get more guests, get bigger servers, whatever we need to do. Uh, I wouldn't suggest you do any more than what you think it's worth or what you're able to do. Not everybody can. People who can't, you know, support financially, you can always invite your friends to listen and tell them how to locate us, how to get to the archives, recommend us, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, Word of mouth advertising is one of the best forms of advertising in the world, and I encourage anybody to support in any way they're able if they do like the show. Today we're going to be talking to Lynn Gibson. We're going to be discussing her trilogy of books on vampires, the Adrian trilogy, trilogy, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, and let's get her you to see him. You did wonderfully. Okay. You did wonderfully. That's, that's correct. All righty. Now, I haven't had a chance to actually read the books myself, and even if I did have them, I'll be honest with you, I'm like 50 books behind right now <laughs> on my reading. You'd think all that time in the hospital I would have read more, but it seems like they got you so doped up, you read a page or two, you fall asleep. <laughs> yeah, I believe you're right. I believe you're right. I, I understand on how it is to be behind on my reading. I, I've been writing steady since 2011, and I don't read while I write. So, yeah, I've got a stack of them sitting waiting me as well. I can hear it. I, can, I definitely hear that. So, I have, however, heard of vampires. I know about the legends of it, and different legends, in fact. I mean, I don't know if you're familiar with this or not, but a lot of people say the vampire legend got started with... Uh, Dagobert, I believe it was, the uh, Vlad the Impaler back in the 14th century. Um, actually, you know, Royce, I blog Vampire uh, Gin and Lore. I started blogging when I signed my uh, publishing contract, and I've done a lot of research all over the world, and I would have to argue that because in, in my thoughts, the vampire have been here as long as mankind has. And, you know, there's a lot of archaeological evidence of of that. It's very interesting to look at the origination theories because there are several of them. There there are several that were formulated uh, in in the Bible era and then in the, you know, in the Dark Ages before that, 12th century, 14th century, 16th century. Every region has its own origination theories. So... You know, who's to say exactly who's right? But like I said, I think they've been around quite a bit longer than that. Well, what you're mentioning would definitely make uh, the Vlad legend a uh, latecomer to the show. I mean, the 14th century. uh, I said what you're you're talking about, ones that have been around long before that, that would definitely make Vlad a latecomer to the scene. (laughs) Oh, yes, yeah, a little little bit, a little bit. It's really interesting if you go back. I'm, I'm actually writing a, another book now. I'm just about finished with it. It'll, it'll be my fifth novel. And uh, I've done a lot of research in the extra-biblical books, the Koran, the Book of Jubilees, um, you know, a lot of ancient religious texts that kind of collaborate with the Bible. The Bible, I'm, I'm not going to say, is, uh, is perfect. It is a very good source of, of reference. However, it is... It's very broad, and, and it's incomplete. And some of these other texts kind of fill in the blanks. And, and once you start digging into those other texts, you realize that they weren't put into the Bible because uh, I, I feel that society probably couldn't handle the truth. Yeah, I would tend to agree with you. Uh, me and me's going to have to do another show based on that since that's an area of favorite of mine, and I've read yeah. many different versions and many extra-biblical books, and I know what you're talking about. Right. The Book of Enoch will open your eyes, will it not? That and the Book of Jashur, too. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The Book of Jashur yeah. talks about, uh, you know, this here DNA mixing with uh, humans and animals that you don't get in the Bible. 
That's exactly right. And then, you know, like we were talking about earlier, that in my mind is where the immortal came from because they were bred from the immortal. You so, mean the vampires? Yes. Uh, exactly, right. Okay. They, were, they were bred from fallen angels, which were made in the, in the image of God, which is immortal. So, you, you know, kind of put one and one together, and then you start doing your backwards research, and there's more than enough there to, to kind of make it a point, you know. But, yeah, we'll definitely do another show about that. So reading the Bible, or not the Bible so much as extra biblical books, could actually give you more insight into the vampire legends and their origins. That's exactly right. You know, that's some things that were referenced back by other, other texts, made me go back to my Bible. I'm like, oh my gosh, I've read this so many times, but I never actually saw what it was saying. You know, so a lot of it's been right there in front of us for centuries, and, and we just didn't know what we were looking at. Okay, now real quick, everybody, <clears throat> I forgot to mention this a minute ago. The call-in number is 347-688-2902 if you want to call in and ask uh, Lynn any questions. And Lynn, before I forget this again... Why don't you tell everybody your fan site? Okay. Well, you can always find me on authorlyngip.com, and there's also a link to my blog there. And, of course, I'm on Facebook. You can search Author Lynn Gibson on Facebook and find me very easily there. And if, if in doubt, go straight to your Google toolbar and type in Author Lynn Gibson. You'll find me everywhere. Now, a minute ago, you was talking about writing a new book and it being your fifth book. And we're talking about your trilogy, it seems like number four is missing somehow. Oh, well, I'm going to tell you all about number four. I'm, I'm going to fill you in. Um, yeah, I started with the Adrian Trilogy back in 2011 and actually self-published the, the, uh, the first volume and was becoming a little bit overwhelmed with it. I'm like, oh, my God, I've got, to, I've, I've got to have some professional help here because this is getting crazy and I still have the day job. <laughs> So uh, I, I did sign a publishing contract and completed the trilogy. And, you know, one of the things that earlier is the publisher gave me a blog site and said, it's, it's going to be X amount of months where your book comes back out through our title. You need to start building a fan base within your genre. So that's when that vampire legend came in, and I started blogging on it, and people started catching on. And, you know, I, I really thought the fan base would build from here, from a local level, which I'm real close to New Orleans. And, of course, everybody knows there's great You would think it would, because uh, New, New Orleans is heavy in different kinds of lore. Oh, yeah, there's some really great stuff. So there are other books, other days. <laughs> but uh, we started getting all kind of hits from uh, from India and Turkey and, you know, all these other places. And they're like, when are you going to do something on, on, on us? We have this. And I would research it and, and put out a blog on their vampire legend and lore. And um, there's actually a professor in India that, that I've befriended. And he uses my material in his class and makes his, his class when they graduate have to write a term paper based on my research. So he knows to go and reference it. And then he's hooked all his students up with my blog site. So that's, it's really interesting to have people halfway across the globe that don't even speak the same language. You know, we're having to hit translate when we're sending messages and kind of piecemeal together what we're saying to each other. But... Um, that, that's been almost a two-year relationship. He's, he's a really great guy, but there, there are others like that. Uh, I've done interviews with people in the Netherlands and just all over the place. It's really fascinating just, just to see that people that far away are into the same thing you're into, and, and they love your work, you know? Plus, doing these interviews it can be a lot of fun. <laughs> yes, always. <laughs> At least it has always. been for me over the last eight years. <laughs> Well, I, well, you're a master at it. I'm still getting on it. I don't know about that. I'm just an old timer at it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll learn from you, I'm certain. Uh, but uh, anyway, I, I wrote the Adrian Trilogy, and I've had several people ask me, what, what was your motivation? Why vampires? And Which is what I usually I'm ask not... at the very beginning. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Why vampires? Well, you know, I, I do love vampires. They're, they're one of the the most uh, intriguing of the uh, dark creatures. However, my genre in general is horror. 
um, what triggered me to actually sit down and say, okay, um, I'm going to sit down and write and finish this book was the Twilight Saga. You know, I, I don't want to bash it because it got the kids to read, and that's a great thing because reading is a dying art. Um, however, vampires don't sparkle. They don't go to high school. They don't walk around in the daylight. You know, when I saw this, I'm like, oh, God, you know, the adults have had it. I, I grew up with Friday the 13th and Halloween and Emmy Horror and The Exorcist and, you know, hardcore horror and that's what it's all about. And all of us adults that are into the blood and guts and slashers are looking at Twilight and going, no, <laughs> it's wrong. So, you know, that, that motivated me to, to bring back the malevolent original roots of the vampire. And the, the saga itself, uh, it starts out with Christian, who, is, who actually is the male vampire and one of the main characters of the, of the series, starts out with explaining his life when he was born and how he became cursed and then it goes into modern day and there's a little romance to it there's a little eroticism to it and it does update the vampire however it does not wear the vampire down he is kind of like a uh, novel is, with some truth laced into it Exactly, exactly. And, you know, a lot of people around here are really intrigued by it because they can read it and they can see bits and pieces of local legend and lore that have been kind of woven into the words of, of the books. And they're seeing, uh, you know, familiar landmarks that they recognize. So they're really cool with that. But, but here again, we have the people in India and Turkey and Brazil that are reading it, and they're getting a taste of our local culture. So they enjoy it because it's their understanding what it's like to live in the deep south and around New Orleans. And, you know, they're getting to see things and they read the book. So it's kind of cool for, for people in both places. Well, I got to tell you, I spent my share of time in Logansport, Louisiana and, and New Orleans, Louisiana. So I kind of got a feel of what you're talking about. <laughs> right. It's, it's different from any other place on the planet, is it not? Yeah, very yeah, much. But you got to admit, they're also a superstitious people for a large part. Uh, yes, yes, we are <laughs> extremely. <laughs> uh, that that does, doesn't die. It just seems to get passed down from generation to generation, and it's actually important. I remember my mother telling me you know, certain things. For example, if you hear an owl outside the back of your house, run out there with a broom and put it upside down against your back door. It's supposed to ward off evil. And, you know, that's an ancient, uh, it's an ancient belief, but I taught my son. <laughs> you know, and this is 2015, and my son knows to take a broom and go and run, put it on the back door of the house upside down. So, yeah, we're very superstitious around her. And, you know, every little bit helps, though, right? <laughs> well, I guess it couldn't really hurt anything. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so, unless somebody runs into the broom or... <laughs> trips over it or uh, stumps their toe or something. <laughs> Uh, that's right, but otherwise you're protected. <laughs> and all three books, they are, are they what, uh, sequential so that they follow the same plot, just a, a new addition to it as it goes? That's exactly right. They, they start out in the Dark Ages and actually go way into the future. And the last volume, uh, volume one is about 300-plus pages. Volume two is almost 300 pages. With volume three was 600-plus pages. Wow! And... Right. Um, it goes into the future, and it describes a post-apocalyptic New Orleans, and it's very political and explains how um, things came to be the way that they are. And, um, yeah, it's, it's a really a, a great book. And I, I've had some interest in a possible prequel. So that might happen sometime in the next couple of years, but I've got a couple of projects that I want to work on and complete before I do that. That could happen. <laughs> I'm going to be totally honest. I couldn't miss the word apocalyptic coming out of your mouth there. It led me to wonder, is there going to be kind of like a blend of uh, end-time uh, scenario mixed in with your last book or, you know, the end of the story of it? Yes. Yes, there will be. So yes, it will be kind of like uh, um, some biblical stuff woven in. No, actually, not not that level of a topic, but uh, more political, like I said. Um, 
did, we've, we've left biblical stuff all to this this book that we're working on now. So, um, no, I, I had a statement to make with our, shall I say, upper-level management here in the United States, and I kind of made that statement. <laughs> <laughs> there's, just, there's just a few vampires in between, but believe me, it, it's going to come back right. <laughs> if it comes back the way that I see it and, and the way that it, it pans out in Adrian's legacy, the United States is going to be all right after a while. <laughs> Well, just out of curiosity, in your own personal opinion, do you think it's possible that there's more to vampires than just myth and legend? Like, there could be some walking amongst us today that we don't even know them? You know, today, Royce, I I really don't think so. And, And if there were, then it would have stemmed from the bloodline of the Nephilim. And with so many centuries and so watering down with every generation the abilities would not be the same as how they were described in ancient times. You know, with every generation, let's say blonde hair. Blonde hair doesn't, you know, continue to be as blonde every generation. So I would think that their abilities would be weakened as well. You know, for me, that's very interesting because um, the tale of uh, Vlad the Impaler I told you about, he's supposed to be a descendant of the Nephilim. And also, there was a guy out there named Lawrence Gardner, he's passed away now, that did a, you know, an article on uh, Starfire of the Gods. And he kind of hinted in his work that this could be the origin of uh, the vampire legend, was the, how back in the, those days, in the very, very, very beginning, in the days of Noah, for example, uh, the ancient gods, the Nephilim, were actually getting their powers or keeping their powers going by drinking the blood of uh, menstrual blood of women, and it was called Starfire, and they had some kind of mixture they put into it, and from that came the legends, in other words. I don't know if you uh, found that in all your searching. I, I, I have actually brushed over some of that, and I personally I found some of it a little bit far-fetched. However, I think he was kind of on point with a, with a good bit of it as well. So kind of offense with with uh, a little bit of it, but um, it wouldn't surprise me. Not a bit. Like like we were saying earlier, the truth is so much stranger than, than fiction. <laughs> Which, like you say, I, I all the time, but being um, a crossbreeding, by the time you get around to any of it today, you might have it, but it'd be in such a small amount that it wouldn't, you know, have the same impact or that you wouldn't have the, the same traits. Exactly, exactly. You know, they've they have unearthed, I know, 700, uh, one of the things that I was reading in my research, over 700 of these giant Nephilim skeletons. And they ranged from like 50 feet to 30 plus feet in, in stature. But if you date back, that's where the taller of them are. So once again, that kind of goes, it collaborates with the uh, the ability and the traits of the Nephilim being watered down and altered with every generation. Now, an interesting footnote on that is those 700 documented skeletons that had been unearthed are also now missing. And what I find interesting about that is that they started doing DNA testing on them. And when they got the initial results, when they first started kind of teetering with it, all that they could say was that there were hum- there was a human DNA there. However, there was there were more links, or however you measure DNA, that they couldn't even explain. They couldn't Unidentifiable they DNA. Right, right. And then they started talking about aliens, and, and you know, I believe that aliens infiltrated the human race because angels were not bore of this earth. Therefore, they were alien to our planet. So yeah, the word alien actually does fit there. You know, if you say it that way, I hadn't thought about it before, but that actually means that the Bible does admit that there were uh, extraterrestrials or aliens, whatever, um, on the earth because it mentions angels, and it doesn't matter if they were from outer space or from another dimension, they still weren't from earth, and that's what the actual definition of alien is. Yep, that's exactly right. You know, everybody gets the little vision of little green men and soft flying saucers, and they're going, yeah, I don't see those in my neighborhood. And they're not looking in the right place, and they have the wrong idea in their head with the word alien. So, yeah, I, I believe that. 
I think that makes a lot of sense. Also, I would like to mention everybody out there listening that earlier on in this show, I commented about Badly, Badly and Paler. But note, I never mentioned that I, I bought that as being the origin. I was saying that I heard it and read it, which is true. I do not know the accuracy of it, but I do know that I also read about the stuff about Lawrence Gardner. I'm clarifying that because it sounds like I contradicted myself when really I didn't for the sensible fact being I never committed to anything. I'm just mentioning what I heard and what I read. Right, right, gotcha. <laughs> I mean, I and, knew and I that sounded that way. I didn't want people to misunderstand. Oh, no, no, but I bet in your lot of work you have heard all kinds of different theories. I, I wish I had the, a bit of the, the knowledge that you have. <laughs> I have read quite a bit, I will be honest, and I don't mean to be bragging, but I happen to know a man named Bob Curran, who is an, uh, an Irishman up in Ireland. And he um, he's a professor of mythology, and he uh, has book after book after book on vampires, golems, uh, uh, vampires in America, uh, any kind of legend you can think of, a vast li- uh, library. You might want to get to know this man. Yeah, that would be interesting. I- I'd like to chat with him. Well, I've got his contact info. He's a good friend of mine. Well, he's been on my show several times, and we kind of you know, established a rapport over the years. Well, I've established yep, a rapport I, with I a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> I would definitely like to talk to him, bounce a couple ideas off of him, and, and see what he thinks, get his input on the subject, because I'm sure he, he's he got some interesting information. Yeah, I think you'd like him. He's, a, he's about roughly 70 years old, and he's got a heck of a sense of humor on him, a very extremely friendly man. <laughs> good. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to know going in. So... At any rate, I just wanted to bring that up to you, and after the show, I'll be more than happy to give you the info on them. I, I may have to refind it, because I've had people get on my computer while I was in the library, and things have come up missing. Uh-huh. You know how that goes. Yep, I sure do. Sure do. So, But coming back to your books, uh, are you going to continue to write about, uh, and it's going to get a little bit off subject just for a minute, but I'm just curious, and I want to ask before I forget. Are you going to stick with vampires? Because you said you're really into horror. Or are you going to run out your se- uh, series and then start with something, a, a little different area of the horror? Well, actually, um, what I've done, I, I do a lot of the horror cons every year. My favorite is Spooky Empire Orlando, where I met a mutual friend of ours, Victor Aurelius, which I Which truly introduced adore. me to you. <laughs> right, right. I, I just love him. Um so what happened there is, is I bring my books and, and I'm marketing my books and, and my flyers and stuff, and the kids are very attracted to it because of Twilight. And, Royce, I won't sell to anyone under 18 because there is a rob them in my books. And when the kids drag Mom over with a wallet, I'd say Mom needs to read it first. Well, Mom wouldn't buy the book because the kid wants the book, and it's not fair to the kid. So what I did was... I wrote as close as a PG-13 book as I possibly could, which means it's still a little strong, not sexually, but violent, um, which is actually fixing to launch it in the next few weeks. And the title of it is Short and Gory, and it gets purchased by 13 and over as long as Mom approves. But it's kind of like Creep Show. Remember Creep Show from the 80s, how there were like three or four different stories in the movie, and they were all horror-based? Think back. Yeah, I think I know what you're talking about. I mean, that goes way okay. back. Yeah, that goes way back, way back with the Crypt Keeper and, and all that stuff. Like I said, hardcore. Kind of like Tales of Crypt. Right, right, right. So that's that's what I did. I wrote a book that's got five short stories in it that are they're very violent. They're they're blood and guts. They're creatures and monsters, and it it really is. Uh, it's a scary book. I gave it to a few of my adult friends to kind of screen for me as a final edit before I sent everything to, to uh, have it printed, and they found it very good. They didn't see that it was watered down for a younger audience other than the language was clipped and, you know, like I said, no sexual content. So if, if the adults were intrigued with it, that, you know, that made me feel a lot better, and I was actually speaking to an independent filmmaker about one, the first short story in the book, and he has a little bit of interest, and I have a little bit of interest, but we've got some, 
we've got some work to do in between us because our vision isn't quite the same. And I, I think he's trying to water it down, and I'm like, I'll go blood and guts. No, it's <laughs> not to. It, I'm not saying Josh would love your way it, of thinking. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'm like, they look at me and they see this little blonde haired girl with blue eyes and they think, oh, how, how sweet. No, <laughs> you take a few minutes to get to know me because I will blow your mind. <laughs> You're a confident person. I like that. Well, you know, let me give you a little, you and your list a little bit about my background. I, I was a military brat. Um, and I went into management when I was 17 years old, restaurant and bar management. Um, then I got a real estate license and actually was the regional trainer and uh, uh, branch manager for the largest real estate company here. I trained all the agents and, and managed them. So these people have seen me in hills in a suit and prim and proper in this area for two decades. And these people have bought my books, and they've read my books, and they went, oh, my God, you were so not what we thought you were. Because they've seen me and known me in the professional and executive world and had no idea that things that lurk in my mind until I started writing. And, of course, you know, as friends in a community, they jumped on board to, to support me and bought my books and actually read them. And now people are looking at me funny. <laughs> I walk in the restaurant, and they're like, they don't know whether to wave or hide. <laughs> <laughs> or at least put on a neck scarf. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But it's a different world. And, and then again, I've had a lot of them that, that buy my books that are very interested, and in, they may not want everybody to know that they're reading my books, but they, they kind of are, are of the same mind as I am. It's kind of shocking to have those people admit that they've had drugs like this or, you know, they're into these kind of things. So, uh, you know, you never know what's going on behind your neighbor's front door once it's closed. <laughs> yeah, kind of like that song, When We Get Behind Closed Doors. Right, exactly right. You just don't know. Sometimes you don't want to know. <laughs> well, actually, I have a neighbor that had heard, I have a book signing here in town, and yeah, it just accidentally happened along while I was there, and she lives directly across the road from me. She's like, oh, my God, I didn't know that you wrote. And then she picked up my book and read the back cover and sat it back down and had that look on her face like, oh, my God, you live across the street from me. <laughs> <laughs> then the moving truck came a few days later. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we just keep the gate closed so they don't worry about us escaping, I guess. Ah, <laughs> uh, well... I got to ask you this question. It's going to, I don't know how people are going to take this. Some might not approve and some might, but you know what? I'm just that kind of guy. Does your book okay. have any kind of uh, sexual uh, content, like the, uh, you know, uh, the mating habits of they the are, vampire, for example? <laughs> right. The Adrian trilogy, it, it is vampire eroticism. Um, they, the, the publisher, mm -hmm teasingly calls it Fifty Shades of Vampire. <laughs> so, yeah, th that's why I won't sell any of any of the three volumes to anyone under 18 because I, I just don't think anybody that's under that age is prepared to read not only the violence but the sexual content that is in the books. Unless you're a parent and you just don't ever really want to have the talk with your kid, then buy the books for them. You will never have to explain anything. They will completely understand <laughs> Well, is there anything in there that kind of like uh, gives a closer insight to any differences with the, uh, you know, lovemaking or the uh, emotions behind it or anything like that that may be different from humans? Um, yes, there are a lot of physical attributes that are quite different from, from humans, the things that vampires can do that we can't. Um, the, the female character of the book in the first series or the first volume of the series is mortal throughout so part of the struggle is um, having a mortal slash immortal relationship in modern times and it's written from her point of view and it explains her reactions and how she feels about things and how she's having to adjust to things and then in the second book um, she almost dies a human a mortal death and of course was saved by a Christian, and at the beginning of the second book, she's awakening, and they didn't know if she was going to survive or not because she was so close to death. 
but as she's awakening, she's noting the changes going on within her body, and she's describing it and explaining it and things she hears and sees that, you know, we might not be able to see. So a lot of the readers find that very interesting, and, and it's their comments are, oh, my God, it's like I, I'm there and I can see it and I can feel it because of the way that it's written. And, of course, to me as a writer, that's like the best compliment you can get if when someone reads your book and they say, I can see what you're talking about. I understand. So not just, yeah, it's a good book, it's a good storyline, but I can see it. So that, I, I love that about the series and, and the feedback from the fans. So was this your creative license or based on research or maybe both? Um, there's, there was a little bit of research done in it, you know, t- just tightening up my knowledge with local legend and lore so I could add those, uh, add those addicts into the series. But, um, no, this is, it's basically fiction. It was just the story kind of started in my mind while I was asleep one night, and I woke up, and it was one of those dreams that kind of hung with me. And as it hung with me a few days, I started going, maybe I should put this down. And I started putting it down and, you know, I walked away because of life. And then the twilight thing, like I said earlier, and uh, I sat down and, and finished it. And it just seemed to, to flow. It took me about seven to write the first book. And the second one came just as fast. The third one's a little bit longer. Like I said, it was, it was 600 plus pages, but... Um, there was a whole lot more going on in it, and there's a whole lot more detail. And it, I tell you, it really would make a great big screen movie. So maybe one day somebody will pick it up because it it would have a following. It really would. Well, look at Dan Brown. His picked up and made the movies. Oh, I know it. I know it. Well, they're doing more and more filming here in New Orleans, so you know it, it might actually happen. <laughs> well, you know, back in the '70s, there was a a good sized demand, I think, for. Uh, vampire type movies because they seem to be out an awful lot and like an american werewolf in london was one of them i believe um mm-hmm. count dracula but uh that seems to have faded off maybe your books can kind of bring it back to the forefront i i hope so you know i'm a huge Anne rice fan um my vampires are kind of a mix between Anne rice and true blood and true blood i absolutely loved like the first two maybe three seasons of but it just went so way far off course that i lost interest in it so you know the beginning of true light was uh, i'm sorry true blood was really awesome the way they wrote it and the the characteristics of the vampires and their agendas um and then the intermingling with uh, modern day life and real people so you know kind of a mix between the two of them And, and i hope so because I felt like True Blood kind of let us down because everybody was into it. We're like, that vampires are back. This, this is perfect. This is great. And then it started with the fairies and, you know, all the other little creatures. And, and we're all, like, flipping the channel to find something else because we're lost, you know? It might so have been I, more I interesting if they pulled them together by making fairy vampires. <laughs> there you go. Uh, little fairy vampires. Those could sparkle, huh? <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, my mind just goes those places. <laughs> but, uh, but you see that I was following you, <laughs> so it's okay. <laughs> well, the thing that boggles my mind about writers like you is where do you find the material to fill up 600 whole pages? I mean, that's just, wow. I mean, you got to come up with a lot. I, I read a lot when I was young. I really did. I had one of those minds where I just, Nothing was out of the box. I've always had a, a great imagination. I've always been very creative. And it, it's to the point in my life where I can actually sit down and do something about it now. So um, I'll be in the middle of a book, and I've, I've got a whole storyline pounding away in the back of my head. and going, oh, my God, i got to finish this because I really want to start on the next one. Um, I, I don't know. It just comes to me, Royce. I'm, I'm lucky like that, I guess. And I, I don't foresee an end to my writing anytime soon because I've got so many ideas to put in print. And hopefully hopefully I'll be able to share all of them with you. Well, i got to say, uh, what I'm wondering is, I've heard people say this, that uh, they'll be watching TV and just stop what they're doing and go start writing in their book because they got an inspiration from the TV show. 
I, I, I buy that. Yep, I, I can buy that. That's exactly right. Or you could be doing almost anything. You'd be at the dining room table talking with your family, and they'll give you an idea. And right after the meal, first thing you want to do is write it down before you forget it. Right. That's right. Uh, and the short and gory, the book we were talking about a little bit earlier, two, two of the stories that are in it were actual dreams. I have some really odd dreams, and, and I wake up and I start writing the stuff it down so I can get to it later, come back and write it. And my husband's like, oh, my God, you dreamt that last night? <laughs> Poor guy. He probably sleeps with one eye open because, he, you know, <laughs> he's, he's always known that I was a little twisted. But now since I've started writing, I've just kind of let everything go and... You know, I don't, I don't, what do you call it? I don't filter myself. You know, I might you know? suggest writing to my wife. She has uh, nightmares on a regular basis and, <coughs> pardon me, has trouble going back to sleep. And one time she even said she had a dream of stabbing me to death. Well, that's not a good one. I, I don't think I've had that without my husband or anything. It's, it's always creatures and, you know things chasing me and stuff like that. That kind of stuff that I dream about. So, Well, this yeah, was over 15 I, years ago. She hadn't done it yet, so I feel like I'm pretty safe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think so, huh? <laughs> and I, I just told her at the time, I know you're not really going to try that because you know I can defend myself. You know I'm an ex-Marine. <laughs> well, there you go. That's right. The wrong one to try to sneak up on with a knife. <laughs> So, yeah, she never did do it, but it was something, I guess, that bothered her because she was having the dream itself. And she hadn't had that one again in a while that I know of that she's told me, but she does talk about nightmares of, of various kinds. And I, she might could actually, uh, if she just sits there and writes about it when she first wakes up, pull a book out of it. Yeah, I think so. She definitely should. It, has she noticed that these dreams typically happen during the change of the season? I don't know why they are, but it seems my most intense dreams happen when the seasons are changing. Actually, so we haven't talked about that. that aspect of it. It just never happened to come up. Hmm. Tell her to think about it. I, I, I bet you she'll be able to correlate some of that with the, with the changing, the falling of the sap, the rising and the falling of the sap, like the old folks used to say. This is a standard question that I ask all my guests. Because... Uh, <coughs> You never can tell. Did you have any things that you hoped to achieve or goal? Uh, uh, for example, when people read them, uh, something you hoped people would gain out of it, they'd learn from it maybe, or, you know, something like that? Um, with the series and, and it being the first thing that I actually did and published, I kind of got my feet underneath me and blossomed as a writer. Um, short and gory, like I said, was kind of done in fun. However, this fifth book that will be coming out, yes, I, I do hope that people get something out of it. If, if nothing more than be pissed off because of the things that I've written and Bible verses that I've quoted, pissed off. Then go sit down and get your Bible and do your own research and tell me what you see. That is Come back my and, and email you and prove you wrong. Right, yeah, prove me wrong. That's exactly right. Do your research and prove me wrong, and that's what's going to scare people. And I don't think a lot of people are going to be willing to sit down and do that because they may be afraid of what they might find. But, but then, too, a that, lot of that people, is my hope. they don't study their Bibles, even churchgoers, much less extra-biblical books. So anybody that studies that material, they're a dread to get into a debate with because they have too much information. That's exactly right. I, I kind of got into excuse language, but a pissing match with someone on my blog site over something that I wrote about the Nephilim. And he started telling me, spouting off what the Bible said, and the Bible said, and, and I started quoting back what the Bible said and you know, <laughs> collaborating uh, scriptures from, from, other, uh, from other books. And my question to him is, out of the three most influential characters within the Bible have no book. How could you remove the book of Mary, the mother of Jesus? Do you not think that that would be a significant enough book to put into the Bible? The same question of Joseph, because Joseph also had a book, too, that was not put into the Bible. And then the third one, Enoch, it was the most discussed uh, prophet within the Bible, Old and New Testament, 
a, one of the three people that God chose not to strike with a mortal death and just snapped up and took him to heaven so he wouldn't have to die. Don't you think that he would have had something relevant to say? It, it's acknowledged throughout the Bible that he had face-to-face somewhat uh, discussions with, with God, with the angels, and he wrote down what they told him to write down. Why wouldn't you put that book into the Bible? And they don't have an answer. And, and you know, once I said all these things to the guy, he disappeared. <laughs> He's never had a rebuttal. But well, I can imagine I so. Yeah, yeah, because he was really nasty with the first things he said, and I said, okay. And I wrote, like, a two-page response to him and never heard another word. So hopefully he's doing some research. Uh, My father is a deacon at a a Southern Baptist church in Mississippi and was raised on the Bible. He and his mother could probably quote you. If if I need to know where verse is in the Bible, I call Dad because Dad knows. And I've had a few things I called him on and asked, and he's like, I- I've never read that. And I'm like, well, I'm looking at this, you know, and he'd get his Bible out, and he'd read it back, and he'd be like, hmm, well, I, I-, I don't know. And to somebody that was raised on the Bible and they can quote a good part of it, I-, I remember as a young child, my grandmother would stand up in church if the preacher had misquoted something. She would straighten him out by memory, not not hold the book up and say, "This is what mine says." She, oh, that's not what, that's not right, preacher. That's this is what it says. <laughs> so she's a lot not, like me. Not Bible, <laughs> right? I'm not, and I'm not a Bible scholar. I've I've read my Bible, um, but I don't I, I don't say that I know everything in it well. I don't think any human on the planet, even if you go to, to college or seminary school to study the Bible, I I don't believe that you'll ever grasp everything that's in it, not only because not everything is complete um, that's within it, but I just don't think it's meant for us to completely understand, you know, not in its current form. Well, I can tell you, me personally, I've read the seven different Bibles from front to back, trying to do comparison of verses, try to see how well they all match. You'd be surprised what you find, by the way. I've also oh, that's taught, exactly right. I've also taught Sunday school. And I could tell you many, many, many verses. I know the Bible really well. I can't say that I know each and every word, (laughs) you know, and that in it, but I can't even tell you where half the verses are. I know what the verses say. I most of the time know who said them, but exactly what book and chapter and verse, you know, I can't tell you that. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um. It's it's interesting. Have you actually read the Book of Mary? Have you said you've written or read a lot of them that were written but not put into the Bible? Is that one of the ones you read? Actually, I know that there's a Gnostic book about Mary, and I, that may be the one you're referring to, that I haven't had a chance to read in, in its entirety yet. I have read the whole, all three books by Enoch. And the book uh, on Joseph that's missing, that was a new one on me. I hadn't found that one yet. <laughs> Yep, there there is. There is. So search for it. Um, there there are some things in there that kind of collaborate with things that were said in uh, the Book of Mary. But, you know, if you think about it, what we were discussing early, Jesus is the Son of God. So, therefore, he was a human form of God who ha- and, and had God's same abilities. He, he was psychic. You know, we may not like the word psychic because of what society has done to it, but he knew... Um, he had the ability to take life, to give life, to heal, all kind of things that we don't know. But it talks about one story in particular where Jesus was somewhere around two years old and was playing with some other children on the side of a, of a stream somewhere, and one of the children pissed him off, and he struck the child dead. And Mary scolded him and made him undo what he did and brought the child back to life. You know, this is a mortal two-year-old with abilities that he couldn't comprehend because of the mortal part of him. And like me, no filter, (laughs) all he knew is that he was angry and he was going to do something about it, and this is what I can do. So, But think about it. It, It's it's normal for a child, for a small child, to react and be angry and, and retaliate. That's just the way he did it, you know. And, and I don't think the public. I read the that public story. Can handle that. Mm-hmm. Did you read the part about the clay animals that he created and made the lost? birds and made them fly? Right, right, right. The birds. That's exactly right. Yep, yep. 
but you could see that, and, and I can understand that, and that doesn't freak me because I, I think that's right, and something within me tells me that's right, and that's part of the story. But, you know, look at who was or who oversaw the quote unquote King James Version of the Bible. He was insane. Well, actually, there's more than one King James Version Bible, too. And there's uh, one I, version I out there that was made in 1611 that has 14 books that the later edition didn't have. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard of that. I haven't had the opportunity to scan through it. I'd be curious to see what was removed after the 14th century, what was in there, you know, that we have access to now. God only knows. Well, know? I was walking down Yale Street over here with my wife one day. We come across a, uh, like a flea market there, and I walked in there. And on display just happened to be a, a really old antique 1611 King James Bible, which you can imagine being a poor person, I couldn't afford to buy an antique. But yeah, I, we probably couldn't afford to touch it. <laughs> I could afford to pick it up and open up a, and read all the different books in it and get an idea, you know, which ones are missing, which ones are, you know, there. And I don't have the kind of memory to let me to go back down the list right here and now, but you could definitely see the difference. Yeah, and, and it's probably easier to understand if you said and read it sequentially with the, with those chapters in the book. It's just what are they understanding? What what are they grab hold to? And you kind of wonder, you know, some of these secret societies that are out here that we may think as, as you know just everyday people are way far fetched. What but are they? Because if you stick to just the King James Version Bible or just what we have today as a Bible, whether it's King James or Lillard or, or whatever, we only have part of the story. So, you know, we're basing religion off of basically part of the story. E even Catholicism, it's been around for centuries, but it still isn't complete. You can't make me believe that it is. Oh, I know it isn't complete, uh, but that's, that would take up a whole big, long show in itself. Uh, to delve in the depths of the uh, Vatican and the Catholic Church, the Mother Church. Mm, yeah, you're absolutely right. But there, it does kind of fall in line. There's a lot. Trust me, I've studied it. <laughs> I bet you have. So if I have questions, I know who to, who to get a, a hold of for reference, right? Sure, no problem. You know where to reach me. <laughs> That's right. I do. I do. See, I'm going to stalk my voice. <laughs> okay. I like being stalked. It means I'm good looking. Okay. If I could just okay. get more nurses when I'm in the hospital to do it. <laughs> there you go. There, there is a high point to be in the hospital, right? So, um, coming back to this here, you a minute ago was talking about Enoch being left out, which you didn't quite cover on that, though I'd like to throw out there if you don't mind, that a lot of people aren't aware of, is if you go read uh, Jude, it's the shortest book in the Bible, it's only one page, and it, he quotes Enoch. And when a passage out of Enoch's book, and that's the part she kind of left out. And when she's making her point, what she's really getting at is if Enoch was important enough for Jude in the Bible to quote word for word, then why was that not put into the Bible? You would think if he was quoting them, he should be able to keep them in there. And if you read the Bible, there are many places in there where prophets and uh, um, apostles, thank you, I had a brain for it there, were quoting... <laughs> Jashur, or other people, or even Jubilees. Jubilees, I was, I was fixing to say that, that's right. And you don't see it in the Bible, even though it's being quoted from, and I'm with uh, Lynn, if it's quotable, why isn't it in the Bible? That's right, that's right. And the book of Jubilees collaborates hand in hand with, with what Enoch's saying as well. I, I believe that I've read all three of the chapters or three of the books of Enoch or, or three of the sections. I know for certain I've read the Watchers team times, just to go back and reference because of the Nephilim. Um, but for the, at the moment, I can't remember the rest of it. That, that has just stuck in my head um, when he's naming the fallen angels and explaining what their gifts were and what they shared with mankind, that, you know, the forbidden knowledge that we were never supposed to have, which, i.e., uh, the result of the flood and, and trying to wipe the DNA off the planet, but it was, it was unsuccessful, um, as you all know. And then that also was collaborated in the Bible when it talks about, oh, what is King's name? Nimrod was 
was the city, I believe, but I cannot think of the king's name. King Nimrod um, over Babylon? Maybe. It may have been so. I think it was like four generations after Noah. Yeah. And, and what the Bible said, I can't quote word for word, but it said, you know, he was a king, he was a ruler, he was this, he was that, and then he became something else. You know, I forgot exactly what that word, the something else was, but he became something else. And that's when that Nephilim gene started kicking back up. So, you know, what triggered that? There's a whole lot of uh, theories out there that say what could have triggered it. But anyway, uh, we've we've excavated more skeletons that have been carbon dated and, and you know, falls in line. Um, once again, as we were saying, not, not the 30-foot giants anymore, but still substantial and still with that. Uh, special DNA strain, and I know nothing about, thank you, government. <laughs> well, I do know that uh, in the case of Noah himself, a lot of Christians are not aware of this. They, it's right in front of them in their Bible, they read it, but it just doesn't stick out uh, to most people. It did to me. Was in all honesty, the reason that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord was that he was pure in his generation. In other words, his seed had not been contaminated with uh, extraterrestrial seed at that point. That's or, exactly or, right. Or it was pure extraterrestrial seed at that point. <clears throat> but, uh, in other words, they could uh, start a fresh generation with him, in other words, which ended That's up getting right. polluted later on anyway. That's exactly right. If I remember right, was it not, it was Shem or Ham? That was a, uh, gosh, the, the worst idols and, and all that stuff. It was one of his sons and his wife that had something to do with the, uh, the DNA strain coming back up or the rebirth of the Nephilim. And that's where the king of Nimrod came from. Uh, it, was, it was his Well, it was Shem. It was Shem or him. No, no, wait. It was Ham's line that Nimrod came from. Okay. So it was, it was him. It, that's what I had read somewhere, but I can't remember exactly where I read that from. And I do have notes, but God is where they're at. <laughs> I'd like to see those notes because uh, you got Nimrod's line or Ham's line there, and you got um, Shem's line. And the interesting thing is about one of them became the uh, fallen angel line or the uh, sinner's line, the uh, you know Satan's line, whatever you want to call it, the you know, demonic seed line, and the other one became right. the messianic seed line. Right. And the problem with That's that right. is you get more information on the uh, messianic than you do on the other line, and the other line ain't really being given, I don't think, in my opinion, a proper chance to defend themselves. Right. That's right. In, in trying to protect future generations, they disarmed us. So I guess they had good intentions, however... Which I think has something to do with the uh, book suppression. Uh, oh, yeah, definitely. And definitely. I know that in the book of Jubilees, one thing was in there that I personally read that would give any minister a reason not to want to have it in his Bible or have people read it, <clears throat> was it was talking about how sinful and wolf-like the preachers of today's world would be like and how they'd have to account for all the people they lead astray. So you can imagine no church would want to read that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They they don't need any more uh, bad, bad publish out there. Yeah, that's right. Bad press, that's right. So, And it, it just seemed like if one of them steps just a little bit out of line, now we're in the age of video phones, and it, 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 it's the age of information. You want something, type it into a search bar. You, there it is. And, you know, things not be as different as they were, say, back in the 50s now. It's just you can't hide anything now. Maybe for a little while, but it's always going to come out somewhere. So who, who knows? Who knows? It just seems like if one of them steps a little bit out of line, it's everywhere immediately. People just zoom in on it because they're seeing it. Or maybe they knew it from the past and have never been able to prove it, and now they can prove it. So... They make sure they get that out there. It's always the good stuff that falls by the wayside. You, you don't see all of that in the press. And that is true. I mean, look at the things that Westboro Church has done, and it's put out in the public for everybody to see. But you know what? Some of their stuff doesn't stay out there more than two or three weeks to a month, 
they have to do something new to get back in the public eye, where some of the other yeah. stuff, um, look at the uh, murder of that Ferguson guy, it's still popping up how much later? That's exactly right. I haven't heard anything on West Berlin since um, since Spock died. How long ago was that? Uh, it's been a few months now. It's probably maybe getting close to a year at this point. Now, I don't remember the yeah. exact day, but I mean the last thing that uh, Westboro did was they was wanting to crash his funeral, and of course they were never allowed to find out where it was at, so they couldn't do it. But that was the last right. you heard about him. But you're still to this day hearing about Mike Ferguson, which started before the Spock event. Yeah, yep. Yeah. It shows. It shows favoritism. I hate to say it, but right favoritism. But they're putting it out there because there's demand for it, and there's demand for it because society is is just not what it used to be. I, a lot of people use the term sheeple, and I, that that's perfect. You know, there, there's not a whole lot of folks like you and me that are willing to sit down and actually do their homework and, and do the research. They're they're going to take someone's opinion and run with it. Well, so-and-so said, or I found it on the Internet, actually. It's probably a bad example, but I found it on the Internet, so it must be true. Back to vampire not necessarily. <laughs> right, right. Well, back to vampire legend, somebody asked me, well, where do you get your information? And I tell them. You know, I'll research an area, and if I find something, then I'll take notes on it, and then I sit and research that. You better have some collaborating uh, points from somewhere else, from reliable sources. If you see something on my blog, there are at least three valid reference points where it came from. I don't, I don't just put hearsay out there. So you got to do the research. And, and that's fine. I, I enjoy doing that because in the, in the position that I'm in, and you're a love of the paranormal as well, we're challenged frequently. I love to be challenged. Ask me because I'm going to tell you. And, you know, I can prove it. I can down with you and show you where it came from. So, And I'm sure you're the same way from the show. Oh, yeah, I won't say it. Uh, I will not state anything as fact. Unless I know it to be a fact, I've proven it to be a fact, I could, I'd be willing to take it to court. And I know where to show you it at. I will tell you many opinions, many beliefs, but they will not be stated as fact. Mm -hmm. There's a big difference because you That's don't right. have to prove anything unless you right. state it as a fact. That's right. That's right. So, and you do have to be careful with, with the legend and lore. Now, I'm, I'm careful with what I put as fact, and it is believed that, or it is said. So, you know, there, there are some areas that may be gray, and those are not the areas that I demand the way it is. You know, I'll leave it there. This is, this is the research. This is where I got it from. Feel free to challenge me or do your own research. You know, there's enough information here for you to go further if you choose to do so. Well, that's just it. So many people do not want to do the research. And some people, they have busy lives, and you can understand that. But if you can't do the research, or you don't want to do the research, who are you to pipe up and decide what's fact and what's fiction? That's right. Well, then why, why should you have an opinion? If you have an opinion, then back it up. If you feel that strongly about it, back it up. I mean, if you have an opinion, leave it out there as an opinion. Don't, you can't state it as a fact. And therefore, you can't trump people who have facts. That's right. <laughs> you know, while, while we're speaking on that, and it's kind of off, off subject as well, but I'm betting your listeners are going to be interested in knowing this. What is your opinion on Lilith and the Bible? My opinion on what now? Lilith. Being oh, okay, yeah, I'm happen. familiar with the Lilith legend. Uh, many I believe her to be the, uh, the first woman before Eve who had actually did not want to be under Adam during lovemaking because she did not want to be subservient to Adam, and that she actually ended up leaving Adam. And her children, I believe it was, was cursed, and she lost many of them. And in Jewish folklore, she, they used to, for years there, for centuries, wear talismans and amulets to protect from Lilith. And a lot of people think this is what, what uh, SIDS is, that was what they call it, Sudden uh, Infant Death Syndrome. Uh, I know that people that believe that the two are connected, uh, not everybody. Um, have you ever seen a picture of Lilith? I have. I've seen quite a few different depictions of Do her. Do you notice uh, the difference in her actually... feet from our feet? Oh, yeah, they're taloned. Yeah. 
So you'd have to believe that she was either uh, born of a DNA experiment or perhaps uh, extraterrestrial. She does not appear to be fully, completely human. So I could not verify how much truth is in the legends. I wasn't there. But, and there's not enough out there to really, you know, concretely say, in other words. But I can say that there's probably, in my opinion, as much concrete evidence for her as there is for Eve. And Eve has a place in the Bible. So your question would be, why not mention both women? That, that's, that's true. And, and the word Lilith comes up in the Bible once. I, I believe it's in the book of Isaiah. And she's not being referred to as a person, but more as an uh, evil force. It's, it's describing the screech of Lilith, and it's talking about demons or, or something. So it's, it's uh, putting her on the same playing field as, as demons or you know, demonic activity. There, there was, and I guess we're legend because we don't know that it's fact, but what I had read, and this is one of the things that I called my dad on, asked him, it said that in the beginning God created man and woman from the dirt of the earth, from the soil of the earth. However, if you read, uh, if you read Genesis in the book, the first time of creation, it says that Eve was formed of one of Adam's ribs so that she would be subservient to him. So once again, we have, we have some things that are kind of brushing on the topic but not really filling in the spots. Um, the legend went on further to say that when she left the Garden of Eden, she went to live by the sea. And this, uh, this is the area that some of the uh, fallen angels were inhabiting at that time. And it was said that Lilith bred with, uh, bred with these fallen angels, and that was the beginning of the Nephilim line on earth. So, you know, you, you really have to think about it because, it, yes, it, it may be legend or folklore, but, gee, it really does fit kind of hand in hand, and it does answer a whole lot of questions. And, well, this you know, is true, but how do you also know if maybe perhaps the Jews didn't invent the legends of the um, Nephilim descending from her to cover up that the Nephilim actually came from outer space? Or did the, we do know that... Uh, well, huh? they did, because they were cast down from heaven. So it was outer space as far as mankind was concerned. Well, I know that, but I mean, they, did, they was wanting to keep them on a spiritual fallen angel level, not a extraterrestrial level, in other words. Oh, right, I got you. Um, I don't know. And there is also the possibility, it would still fit, just like you say, that since the Nephilim were not the actual uh, originators, they came from the Watchers, who were the actual AETs, and the Watchers were mating with humans, that that would still blend with what you were just saying. Anyway, either way it goes, it would still be the same. Right, right. And and speaking of the Nephilim mating with, with humans, this was one of the things that the pissing match on my blog site was about. He's stating that, you know, an angel created the Nephilim line. Yes, exactly. And I said, because they were forbidden to, to lay with the daughters of mankind. That was God's commandment to them. Leave them on. This, these are my children. Well, that didn't happen. And it probably didn't happen because they were told, don't do it. But yet again, it didn't happen. And I told the man, I said, okay. If you're telling me that they were all 30-something feet in stature when they arrived here on this planet, you explain to me how a 30-something foot male mates with a, a female at this time where the average is probably right around 5 feet. Explain that. It's physically impossible. And if it was impossible, how on the world, or how in the world, with no medicine, no nurses, no hospitals, no drugs... How would that mortal woman give birth to the seed of a giant? How did that happen? And I'll be honest with you, I don't mean to... to, I'm I'm on Studio A, and this is supposed to be G-rated. I'm going to try to say this as G-rated as I possibly can. I'm saying this because of what I'm about to say. I'm highlighting what you were pointing out a minute ago, in other words. When she says it's impossible, though, what you have to imagine... Is the point of insertion, what is then actually inserted, if on an average man is only six inches, could as well just as well be 60 inches or more on a 30-foot giant. You're talking about a greatly enlarged 
piece that's going to be going in to a hole that has not grown, in other words. So it would stretch something out and bust it wide open. That's exactly right. So so how did it happen? Because it did happen. It, it, there's plenty of proof. It, it did happen. Well, the answer that I've ran across with that, and I believe it came from the same place where I read um, how Lilith was created and why she was left out of the Bible and all these things. And, and I keep wanting the book of Jubilees, but I don't think that's right. Um, it was said that the fallen angels possessed the men, and that's how the actual process happened. And, you know, that kind of makes a whole lot of sense to me, too, because a light bulb went on. You know, demonic possession, it, it's a fact. It, it, it happens. A lot of people shake their head and walk off, but it does happen. It's been documented. It's in the Bible. It's been documented since the beginning of the time. So is being possessed by the Holy Spirit. Have you ever been in church and you caught the Holy Spirit? You I know haven't. I'm talking about you. I have. Um, it's it's an overwhelmingly peaceful and warm sensation um, coupled with an adrenaline rush. It, it's, it is a fantastic feeling to have if you have ever had the Holy Spirit. And in my eyes, it is a possession. It is another spirit that is within you are a part of the spirit, or an influence of the spirit. Same thing with, with demons. Well, here we go with yin and yang. If there's a dark, there's a light. So I could see that happening. You know, going back to the, the mating process, I could understand that and how it would happen, then, but not in a physical aspect. Well, that would be kind of hard. And how do you derive um, flesh and blood from spirit in that kind of fashion? Yep, I, I don't proclaim to have the knowledge that they had or the knowledge to explain that. All we know is that it happened, and and I'm I'm with you on the whole physical thing just not be possible. So it had to happen some way. So, In fact, that's know, exactly what they claim happened with Mary and Jesus. Yeah, that's that's right. Because Mary didn't have sex. It said she was a virgin. She was the Holy Virgin Mary. Um, so something happened. It may not have happened on a physical plane, but it, it happened. So apparently, it can happen spiritually. It did in her case, anyway. Yeah, I've tried to look that up before, and maybe I'm just not sure the right keywords. But that's one topic I have not been able to grab a handle on on the internet. Um, go go onto my blog. You can actually find it there. There's a search bar on my blog. Just type in Lilith, and you're gonna you'll see there's quite a few things because she's captured my attention for a long time. I've done a lot. Oh, of I mean, I've read about, well, that's, that's not what I mean. I'm talking about oh, 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 okay. the actual functioning of, you know, spirit mixing with flesh and actually becoming flesh, in other words. Oh, yeah. Uh, if I run across where I read that, I will definitely shoot it to you. But, you know, like I said, the Book of Jubilees keeps popping in my head, but I just don't think that's right. So it must be something along those lines or something that was within that era as well. And the Book of Jubilees is really a retelling of uh, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, mostly. A lot of right, people are not right. aware of that. Right, and it, and it kind of collaborates with Enoch, like we were saying earlier. I, I didn't think that was right, so I'll, I'll do some digging and see if I can't find it for you. And we'll talk about it on another show, because I, I think that deserves a whole lot more discussion. <laughs> I do know that I have personally met pastors <coughs> that will not even mention... An extra biblical book like Enoch. I mean, I printed a copy, took it to a Pentecostal preacher one time after service, and he read it. He said he could not tell me anything wrong with it. He, he, you know, he was familiar with the material, but he did not think it should be mentioned. I wonder why. Did, did he give you an explanation? He said he couldn't give me one. That was the weirdest part. I know he wasn't being honest with me. He, I mean. Something like that, you're going to have a reason or you're going to go along with it. Come on. You can't tell somebody you don't have a reason for something like that. Right, right. I mean, not do it truthfully, in other maybe, words. Maybe he's one of those people that just really needs to think about something for a while before he makes a, a, a termination. Or it could be he's so convinced that if it was meant for the Bible, it would be in there, and if it was not in the Bible, then it just can't be mentioned. Uh, that's a very valid point. I, I and maybe he didn't want to say that because he knew that the argument sounded was right. weak, in other words, so he'd rather just say, 
I don't have a reason to make a weak argument. That's right. That way he wasn't on the defensive, and he, uh, I, I gotcha. I can relate to that. But, I mean, there's a lot of pastors that feel that way, and it's not just about the book of Enoch. It's about uh, anything that was not originally in the Bible. Sorry about that. I have dogs. Somebody wants on the air. You <laughs> They're need a making a to, debut. You need a minute to shut the door or something? <laughs> no, we're good. <laughs> okay. We're well, good. We, I had to put the fly swat. They know that means to be quiet. We kind of drifted off of vampires, however... We did stay on an area with one of your books. It's your newest book, right? Right, right. That's that's uh, the one that I'm working on. I'm actually <clears throat> writing the last last in it now, so I'm thinking I'll put it out sometime around October or November of this year. So it hadn't went out to the publishers yet? Oh, no, not yet. No, not yet. It's still a work in progress. You know, like I said, it, it is a fiction based on truth, but it's required a lot more research than anything else I've done before because everything else was just fiction with maybe a little legend and lore in it. But this, this is different. This is, this is something that I haven't done. Like I said, debut author two years ago, which uh, 2014 represented the full calendar year that my books were available to the public, or the, the Adrian Trilogy. And I was the second uh, and highest selling author in the publishing house, but the top selling author in the horror genre in the publishing house. And that's that's something that I was told doesn't happen very often. So, uh, you know, maybe I was right. The, the so you've been successful. I'm sorry? I say you've been successful. Um, it, it, it is successful. I'd like to see it be a lot more successful, but we're just getting out there and I'm just getting started. And a lot of folks like you are teaching me things along the way, so... Uh, I, I believe it's nowhere near finished. Uh, or it, it has not hit its apex yet. It, it's going to continue to grow. Um, we're doing some things at the end of uh, June or maybe July here locally at a southern plantation where we're going to be celebrating the success of the trilogy as well as the launch of Short and Week. And the guy in you is going to love this. Um, my husband is a hot rod guy. He does... Uh, you know, Harleys and builds these big motors for people putting their race cars and stuff. So his collaboration with the Adrian Trilogy series, he's built a 16-foot uh, front-end dragster. <laughs> and, the dra <laughs> yeah, it's, it's Adrian's Fury is the dragster's name. Um, he's just about finished with it. He's built it all by, all by hand, a lot of the parts on it he's made himself in it will be NHRA certified as a six-second car. It will do 200 miles an hour plus. But it's going to start making the rounds with it. some of these appearances, both local. Um, we actually have spoken to the owner of Spooky Empire in October in Orlando. There will be a spot on the floor for us there uh, for the dressers. So that's going to be pretty big. I don't think anybody else has ever done any printing with a front-engine dragster for a for a series, a book series, if they have. I'm not aware of it, but we think a little outside the box down south. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm in Houston, Texas, which is down south, and a lot of us down here do, too. <laughs> well, you can come and check the dragster out. We'll let you drive it. <laughs> Maybe I'll wait till y'all come to Houston since it's hard for me to travel. Okay. Well, we've uh, got a couple places in Texas kind of laid out for either the end of this year or the beginning of next year, so it's very possible we may see you face-to-face -face sometime soon. Just don't get scared when you see me. I'm pretty ugly. <laughs> well, you know, after the conversation we've had for the last hour or so, I, th I think you see that I'm not even shaking. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's not well, easy to scare me. What's the title of your new book going to be? The title of the new book I'm kind of toying around with as The Wicked Truth. What do you think? The Wicked Truth, huh? The Wicked Truth. And this is going to yeah. deal a lot with about the wicked truth of the church or the scripture or both? Yes. yes. And then, like I said, uh, uh, fiction based on truth. The fiction part of it, there has to be a storyline for people to get into the book. Um, the, the main character of the book which I'll give you a heads up, and your listeners are getting a heads up that the rest of the world doesn't know. This book is, is going to be somewhere around 400 pages, and the main character is never named in it. And the reason why she is never named in it is because it's not relevant. 
what is relevant is the information that's in the pages. Even though there's some fiction in there, there's relevance in, in what is being said and how scenarios are being played out, and all somebody needs to do is read the book and look at the newspaper, you know? It's kind of eye-opening. It, it will be very controversial when it comes out. It's, it's going to make a lot of people very angry, but like I said, challenge me. Challenge me on the information and then sit down and do your own research. Well, I tell you... I don't care how many shows you interview on that for that particular book. You do not want to miss interviewing on my show for that book because I have put so much study and research into it that we could probably just talk right down the line with it. I bet we could. I'll tell you what, Royce, as soon as I get my first copy print, I'll send it to you. And that way you can read it and then we'll do the show or we'll sit and debate about the book. I bet you'll enjoy it. What you could do that some authors do is they'll send me a uh, like a PDF form before it comes out in the actual print, and I'll read That's that, exactly and then I'll write like I'll a um, an endorsement or a blurb of what I think about the book that they can uh, put on the you know like the back of the book with the other comments that people make. You know what I'm talking about? Right, I do. And that way you could have a chance to have me put a little plug in for the book for you on the book I'll, itself. I'll certainly do that. I'll certainly do that. Once I get this final chapter or this final thing written, I'll step away from it for about a week, and then I'm going to reread it. And, you know, I'm mm -hmm. sure I'll add and change a few things, and then once I do that, I'm finished with it. So I'll send you a copy of it then. It's about a month or so yeah. as soon as I can get this other launch out of the way and get focused back on it. Well, I said PDF. I don't know if you know how to make a PDF copy. Uh, I don't know what your extent of uh, computer savvy is. But if you don't, any text document, HTML document, or it can come in any form. It's just, you know, you paste the actual words onto anything and just send it in a format. No, I can send a PDF. Oh, you can? Okay. That makes life a lot easier. Easier, smaller file, easier to, to email out. So, yep, that would be the answer. I know that... Um, there's a program out there called Open Office. It's like a. Uh, I have it. That's probably what you use to run your PDFs, then, isn't it? Um, I use that, and then there's something else. Listeners, chime in on this. I'm telling you, if you don't have this, you need to download it. It is a free download called Qt PDF. And what it is is a virtual printer that you download onto your computer. In any form that you put on your computer or any book or any manuscript, you can hit print and then select Cute PDF Printer, and it will uh, it changes the file over to a PDF, and you can save it anywhere. Best, best free program on the market, Cute PDF. And, uh, You're writing that down, aren't you? <laughs> well, Cute is easy to remember. I was going to let everybody know, though, as far as the other goes, the open source, that's also free. Uh, open Office, it's a... Microsoft Works made open uh, made for the uh, free free for the public that you can download from SourceForge, and it uh, it does anything that Microsoft Works would do. Pretty much, basically, yep. if anybody wants to write a book, it's a great program to have, and I'm pretty sure you'll attest to that one. I, I do. Yep, I use that as well, and it's very easy to use. Just yeah. like uh, just like Microsoft Word. You can do so much with it, spreadsheets and everything. So. Yeah, I would rec uh, recommend, especially I recommend anything that's free. I mean, how can you go wrong? As long, unless right. it's a virus or something, you know what I'm saying? That's exactly right. Woody. You can always do a little research before you download anything. Just problems with whatever and, and hit your Google search key and, and check it out before you download anything. Well, when it before, now we still got about 20 or more, well no, actually almost 30 minutes or so. Well, actually, probably about 40. But I don't want to forget to get a chance to, in case this leads into, you know, a longer conversation, to find out if there's anything you want to mention that I didn't think to bring up. Actually, I think we've talked about everything under the sun. We've done very well. <laughs> um, books, the books are available on Amazon right now, also as well as uh, Books A Million, Barn Noble, any, any of the high-end book retailers you can find them there. If you want our copies of the Adrian Trilogy, volumes one, two, or three, feel free to inbox me on the fan page on Facebook, and we can take care of that. Um, I send a lot out from here. I, don't, I really don't know where my Amazon sales and all that stuff are, 
I think I'm doing pretty well, but uh, I guess I'll just leave that up to the next quarterly report to find out. But I do send a lot of stuff out here from, from my house. I joke about the UPS man, hey me. <laughs> we just meet him. We meet him at the gate with a dolly and a bottle of water because he's like, golly, I'm tired of looking at y'all with these boxes of books. <laughs> Poor guy. He's a great guy. Do you sell some in your neighborhood? Um, oh, absolutely. I keep I keep copies in my trunk because it's very seldom that I leave the house and go anywhere and don't look. It, it's getting to the point now where I go somewhere and people look at me and say, that's the vampire lady. And, you know, I'm, I'm cool with the vampire lady, but I'm, I'm the horror author. But now we'll, we'll stick with, with the vampire thing. It's cool. <laughs> so it, it's not unusual to be in like Walmart and sell a book or a grocery store or wherever else. I've just I've learned to keep them with me. Well, if you don't mind a personal question, and I'm just curious, do you go to church? Um, I have not gone recently, no. I guess you understand why. Uh, you know, I believe in fellowship. I do believe in God. I, I think deists are idiots. Um, just a little bit of common sense tells you that there is a God. Um, my faith in the Bible is true. I do believe the Bible. Like I said earlier, it's not the whole story, but that doesn't mean what's in there isn't valid. My problem churches are... I've done so much research that if I go and listen to a sermon, chances are I'm not going to agree with something that the preacher says. And I just haven't found that happy fit yet, you know, a church. And now it's a bit more difficult because I am that vampire lady <laughs> to walk into a church these days. I'm not real sure, <laughs> not real sure how the congregation would react to seeing me. <laughs> I can imagine. Maybe okay. It, it may not be okay. You never know. And you don't want to actually come out and say something unkind if they say something unkind, but yet you, your mouth might get ahead of you. Right. I, I agree with that. And, and I'm open-minded. I, I don't judge people. I believe that everybody has the right to be exactly who they are and to think and feel the way that they do. And who am I to challenge them? I'm, I'm a grain of salt. Now, the only person we have to worry about impressing is God the Father, and, and that's how I live my life. If I can help somebody, I, I do, even if I have to go out of my way. And, and I abide by the Ten Commandments. However, there's just there's more to it than what we've access to. And a lot of times, you know, if you, if you get into a religion discussion with someone, chances are you and I will, will we have a great conversation. We agree with each other. But the chances of us running up on someone else in public or out on the streets that are going to be accepted, accepting and open-minded to some of the things that we would say are not good. You know, it's, it's not good, and it's things that we may know in our heart to be right, i.e. the Book of Enoch and, and why those books were left out of the Bible and, and things along those lines. It's not, it's not receptive well with the general public, so it's very hard to have a religion conversation with anyone. And I've learned to even stop having those conversations with my father because, you know, I believe that there are other things. And, and he may, but he's so set in his religion and the way that he, the things that he believes in, the way that he lives his life, he's fine. And, and I, I would not want to plant any kind of seed of doubt in anyone's mind. However, I, I and you cannot be the only ones that are curious about what, what was left out. You know, if you read Genesis... You, understand, you can understand what is in the book of Genesis, but A doesn't equal B, or, or A doesn't equal C, because he's not there. You know there's something missing, and a lot of people just, they don't have it in them to, to know what's missing. You know what I mean? Yeah, actually, I know exactly what you mean. you got to understand that my father was also a preacher. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, so I feel you. <laughs> I feel you. Uh, we got Terrell in the chat room asking, what is your topic? I guess he's either coming later. We dripped it and he got confused, but for anybody out there listening, it's uh, we're talking about the Adrian trilogy, her uh, her trilogy on vampires. But it ha uh, we got drifted off into some biblical while we were at it. <laughs> I was just in the chat room while you, you were talking, trying to um, you know uh, see if Terrell wanted to be my guest tomorrow on a different network that I'm on, and uh, he hasn't answered me yet. 
Oh, he said put he some info on our Skype. <laughs> huh? he, he's heard our conversation, and he's like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> well, actually, he's been my guest before on uh, Revolution. Oh, okay. Oh, and he's okay, actually okay. Ho- hosted my show for me once when I was in the hospital. Hmm. So, yeah, he's got his own website and everything. In fact, I'll send you the link to tomorrow's show, uh, probably after the show. I was going to say you were talking about the uh, books left out of the Bible. Um, I read a site somewhere that went down a list of reasons why they didn't include these in the latest King James Version. And I don't have that open to quote it right now, and I don't have it logged in my memory. I've only read it once. But from what I did read of it, what I can say is everything that they accused of the uh, the books that were left out could be said for the books that were in there as well. Say that again? Every, every reason they gave why the books didn't belong in the Bible, those same reasons applied to the rest of the books as well. It didn't that's do them what no I thought good. You said. Yeah, that's what I thought you said. That didn't make sense to me, and I guess it just doesn't make sense. <laughs> well, I mean, when they, the reasons for leaving those books out of the Bible... Oh, oh, okay, I got gotcha. you. I, I read that article about it. I, I'd had to go over it with you. One of the, the the reasons I didn't think these books didn't belong in the Bible that I do remember was that they were written in Greek, and they come from a Greek standpoint. The whole problem with that is the whole entire New Testament is done in Greek. I was waiting for you to get to the punchline because I, I didn't see what the problem with that would have been. There, there shouldn't have been a problem. I mean, to me, it was like they were just making excuses, in other words. Right, right. So That's like saying, well, we didn't put it in there because it's going to rain one day next week. Pretty much. Uh, so <laughs> they, had a, they had like seven or eight reasons down there, but they were all the same type of thing, in other words. So none of it was mm-hmm. valid, is it? Uh, I could probably we, you and me could probably discuss it on a show sometime. I could look it back up. Uh, but it, I'd had this conversation with somebody in a hangout, a Google hangout, named Gary, and he was telling me that he had read this information and he agreed with it because he's trying to convince me to believe the Bible's in, uh, infallible. So that's when I went and looked it up, is when he was trying to convince me, and that's what I found. Uh huh. So. See. He's a pretty yeah. nice guy, well, though. Anything that mankind has had in his possession or has had anything to do with, I put you there flaws, just because we're human. That's where that saying came from. I'm only human. That means I'm flawed, and so are my works. Okay. Terrell is saying 66 books are God's living forward slash active word. So I take that to mean he believes the Bible is infallible. And a lot of his material is based on end-time prophecy. Mm-hmm. So uh, that would make a lot of sense. Uh, of course, that would I, be interesting. can't say that me and him would agree on every point, but I respect his beliefs. Right. I mean, That's I would, not an area that I've done a whole lot of research in, so I'd be real interested in hearing what he has to say. I challenge him. I'd be, I would just be interested to hear his theories. I'm kind of like you. I'm a big believer in the golden rule. And I don't need somebody judging me and <clears throat> telling me I'm wrong, especially when they don't really know if they're wrong or I'm wrong or not. Right. I mean, and that's you know, exactly right. And therefore, I'm not going to do it to somebody else. Pretty much that's plain right. and simple. He's got a right to his belief. I've got a right to mine. Uh, God that's needs right. to be the revealer of what's right and wrong. Not him, not me. That's right. That, that's personally how I feel about it. Um, that's why I'm not into people that, you know, are gay bashers or, you know, uh, racist or any of that. I'm against all of it. Right. For me, you can't have... The Bible says to love your brother. You can't live in peace without being tolerant of your brother. That's right. That's That's pretty much the end of the story. You can't live in peace without tolerance. It doesn't mean you have to agree with your brother. It doesn't mean you have to think your brother's right. Doesn't mean you have to join them. You just respect them. Just respect them. It's all you have to do. That's right. And I think society needs just a little bit more of that. I think society needs a whole lot more. I mean, I look at (laughs) Facebook every day, and the things that I see, and some of them true, some not, and I'm not naive enough to, you know, buy everything I read. Don't think that for a second. I've been around the block too many times. Uh, 
I've been stripped of all naivety. <laughs> but, <laughs> but when you go to checking out the stuff and finding that it, stuff that is true, it's pretty doggone depressing. <laughs> yeah. That's why people should read more, and, and, I, and I recommend fiction, <laughs> because the truth is just not good sometimes. Well, at least when the fiction isn't something that you'd like the world to be, you can remember it's only fiction. <laughs> That's right. And the unfortunate part is you will come to it and, and close the book at some point. <laughs> <laughs> that, too. But in this world, we have to live in it, and the only escape we have is sleep at night and death. That's right. And taxes. Taxes is an escape? Oh, I thought you said, no, that's not what I thought you said. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Sleep and death. No, taxes is not an escape. <laughs> not a bit. No, that's something you it have to do before you, uh, between when you're born and when you die. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, now, I think I pretty well gotten everything out and now I'm trying to think of something self, uh, new to add in there to what we've already added. Um, I know that we did talk about the possibility of vampires being the uh, descendants of the Nephilim but uh -huh. you have to remember that the Nephilim are the descendants of the Anunnaki and I'm mentioning right. this here because the Anunnaki is, stands for those that come from heaven or from uh, heaven to, uh, to earth to send. That means any race out there, uh, that there was a race of vampires, and they could have come here. There was a race of uh, lizard-likes, uh, humanoids, they could have come here, or even insect type, or whatever types there were. Uh, point being, being born from a Nephilim does not necessarily mean it has to be ending up like a vampire. Okay. Well, you know, the, the word vampire didn't even come about until, I believe, the 12th century. Um, you know, back in the biblical times, in Lilith's times, and, and there was a, there's a vampire legend that says that they were began with the mark of Cain, another that says it, it began with the curse of Judas. But with all of those legends and, and with the description of some of these creatures in the Bible, it, they were something else. They weren't called vampires until Friday. And I think this came from... Um, the Middle East, somewhere in the region, maybe maybe Romania, where the actual term vampire came up. That's right, it came from Romania. Um, and, of course, they had their own origination theories, too, and, and we've seen the Nosferatu and, and uh, some of their stories. China has their own origination story. Uh, just there, there are probably a hundred of them. I've only brushed the surface with some of the ones that I've discussed in my blog. So, you know... It's, it, it was like I said at the beginning of our conversation, it's my opinion that is probably the most valid origination theory is looking back at, at the Nephilim, as you oh. pronounce it. I call it Nephilim, but it may be, just be my southern draw. I don't know. <laughs> I can understand that, and that's, I'm not disagreeing with that. Uh, what I was saying, though, is that some of these Nephilim that were born could have been vampires, some of them... Uh, more reptoids, some of them more insect. There could have been more than one that were descended from those same days. You're absolutely right, because there are some that are described in the Bible that we don't know, we don't see anything, that we've never seen anything like the things that they describe. So, yeah, it's very possible, you know, you're mixing DNA strains with, with, some, with humans, Something could have happened, and it could very well be some other type of creature. We don't know. Could like have a whole earlier, host of different. We weren't there. A whole host of different creatures that became various legends. That's true. That's true. Because a lot of these vampire legends that I've I've written on, they're not humanoid. Um, some of them are spirit-like. Some are just uh, repulsive creatures. Uh, you have the revenants, of course, those are humanoids. Those are uh, the walking dead, not zombies, but blankers. So, yeah, there, there's there's a very good possibility of that. I think there's pretty well an excellent one. Uh, now, in your book, I didn't ask you this earlier, I just thought of it. Do, do you do anything to inform people about this origin and maybe even trace it through history any uh, 
as part of your um, storyline? Um, in the fifth book, yes, I do make several references to the bloodline of the Nephilim and some some of the uh, renowned people who are, who have said to or who are said to have had that DNA or or members of that bloodline and. Some of it will send a chill up your spine because most of these names, some of them we may not know, but as it traces it back, it actually, one of those that I've studied the most began at the, the King of Nimrod um, and tracked up to even the terrible uh, Napoleon, um, Hitler, you know, some of these worst world-renowned figures, the most evil warriors and the most evil leaders are said to have had that same gene. And the research that I've read, this person has put a lifetime into it. And it's not something that's slapped together. He, he's joining A and B and C and D, and you can look at it. It, it looks very valid. And, and knowing that what you and I know is probably very possible. Um, we we all have some of Jesus in us because we're all descendants in some way, shape, form, or fashion. So it's quite possible that it could work the same way with with the bloodline. And there's a lot of people who will swear, <coughs> pardon me, that Jesus never had kids. Uh, most of people in that. most people in church don't believe he did. However. I have actually found a lot of stuff on the internet and books and talked to numerous authors and theologians and scholars that have got evidence that, you know, indicates that the likelihood of him having to have kids is very high. And some of the people have even gone so far as to name his kids. Uh, like one of them, I believe, was Sarah, would have been his daughter. And there was a justice that was involved. Or just then, I think it was just this, uh, and it seems like there was another one that I'm forgetting. I mean, I, I haven't read this in a long son. time, huh? Yeah, I believe there was a, a second son. I knew Sarah, but I yeah, a second the son. Uh, it wasn't Justice or Justine, uh, the one I'm, but there was another son. I can't quite put a name, a finger on his name right now. That they did mention, and part of Lawrence Gardner's work was tracing the uh, lineage of Jesus. And there's a family out there now who is supposed to have done it that was written about by Tim Wallace Murphy uh, called the Sinclairs. But they will tell you up front that the amount of the uh, bloodline they have in them is so tiny that you wouldn't even want to think of them as royal or anything. Right, right. Because it's so far diluted down, but... And they don't have no, they're not making no big airs about it. You don't see a ton of books about them on it or anything. Uh, you know, it just, the, uh, Tim Wallace is the main one that mentions them. Right. I, I've heard that as well. And, and I've read up a little bit on that. So, you know, that may be a topic for a, a future book later on. But that's going to take a whole lot more research. Well, that was the book that Dan Brown wrote that got got to the movies. Right, that's right. <laughs> And like you, he wrote a That's fiction right. around it. Yep. Yep. I believe that, though. I really do, because that, that's kind of what we were originally put here to do, not to go out, be, be, do, and become, but to procreate. That's why we were here. So he, Jesus lived a normal life. He just, why wouldn't he do the same thing that everyone else did? I personally, I'm of the opinion that we're here for various reasons, uh, amongst them procreation. Uh, I think also for learning, growing, and maturing, and um, and actually everyday basic uh, existing, the experience of existing. Uh, you know, the things that if you were maybe in a a, a less uh, material environment you wouldn't get the experience of things of the material world that you can actually live here and experience the good and the bad that goes along with it, in other words. Right, right. And I agree with that. I um, might have missed it, my, my intention. It, it, we're not put here for material reasons, not, not to grow up and be doctors and lawyers. I set the path. But what you're saying is, is what I meant. Yeah. Well, I know. I, I'm just saying, um, you know, 
or maybe not meant for material reasons, but you're here so you can experience the material side, in other words. I mean, you're not here to, you know, make it a part of who you are, but you're here to right. enjoy it while you're here, to experience it while you're here. You know, the whole Bible itself, uh, it teaches about being temporary sojourners here on the earth. I don't know if any of the other scriptures do it. I haven't seen it in any of the other ones, but I know the Bible does teach it. And that would explain a whole lot, which there's an awful lot of different earths for experience out there. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't there now? <laughs> and nobody and has you've yet... Seen a lot more than, you've seen a lot more than many, having been an ex-Marine, I'm sure. Well, a lot of people have not yet figured out why are there billions upon billions upon billions of planets around us that, unless there's life on it, do not appear to be serving any purpose? Yep, that's a very deep question. And once again, we would all be fools to think that we were the only form of life on this planet. The, the Bible tells of the Earth's creation and the creation of mankind. It doesn't reach out beyond that and, and tell of Saturn's creation and, and you know, their population or, or whatever planet it, it may be. The Bible is based on Earth and, and our history. So, yeah, I would have to think that there's probably a few more Bibles out there that are on different planets with uh, different beginnings or maybe some that are not so different from ours. Uh, I would I might near think there almost would have to be. A, or God would be a pretty doggone wasteful God or, you know, Awful bored. Did that well? It'd be the only way he could get his amusement. <laughs> I mean, right. Got to be something right. out there. You would think. I mean, of course, that's coming from a materialistic human standpoint, but that's the only one I have to come from. That's right. That's right. And and if there if there are things that are out there that the government's aware of, God knows when we'll become aware of it because they care. There's a topic for an entirely aware. different show. Once again. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I, I do know... All, all, of, your, there's all a, of your listeners have had a, a broad spectrum of things <laughs> <laughs> to entertain them this afternoon, from vampires and fiction to the creation theories for both mankind and vampires, the future. Definitely, we've touched all bases, have not? <laughs> Is it unusual for you to interview with a host that gets you drifted in so many directions? <laughs> No, not at all, because typically it, it all goes out the window when talking about the blogs and vampire origination. That it, it starts drifting from there. So this is pretty typical. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's where the interest is. You know, when we get started and, and we start talking about vampire lore, which is it's a part of my background because it's how I became who I am, uh, people are curious and, and they want to know. So they start asking questions, and then that's kind of what we always focus on, origination theories and Nephilim and ancient scriptures and things along those lines. So, uh, it, was, it was very interesting to be able to speak with you, someone who actually has uh, done research and can collaborate some of the things that were in my mind and some of the things that I've discovered in my own research. That, that's pretty cool because a lot of times when I'm on the radio or when I'm doing talk shows, the, the host doesn't really have a background and doesn't have a whole lot of information on those topics. So they're curious and they ask questions and you and I have been able to have basically a conversation. So I'm, I'm hoping your listeners have enjoyed it. Yeah, I, I've done a lot of study in a lot of different areas. So that is true. Um, <laughs> now, Terrell's in the chat room saying, we are here to be judged. Hebrews 9, verse 27. Earth is an infant state like a watermelon seed, we are the first fruits. The others will be populated uh, and later in ages to come. Um, so, you know, he obviously has a little different take than we do, which, like I said, I do respect that. But I would like him to uh, come do that interview tomorrow, if he will. It won't be on Revolution because that's not where I'm uh, slotted at tomorrow. But if he is interested, I'd be more than happy to discuss this topic with him and his disagreements and I have no problem with hearing him out. I mean, he's been on my show before. He should know that. I want to say <laughs> I, I that. I hope that he takes you up on that as well, because I, I will definitely tune in. I, I, I'm very interested in what he has to say. 
uh, educate me. Like I said, that is not something that I've done a whole lot of research in as far as the end of time. So, yeah, I would definitely love to hear what he has to say. Well, I'm not sure when he put that in the chat room about we are here to be judged if he's not paraphrasing rather than a word for word quote without looking it up. Uh, which I okay. plan to do after the show <laughs> as part of preparation for tomorrow because if I know Terrell, he's going to want his side out there. <laughs> and that's also, a good thing. That's a good thing. I think your listeners will benefit from hearing his, his viewpoint. I want to let everybody know that whether I'm broadcasting from my own stream at Talk Now Radio, uh, if I'm on Revolution Radio or another network, uh, not to mention any other networks on this network, as you know, that's mentioning the competition. But uh, no matter where I'm broadcasting from, I have a YouTube channel that I put all my shows on that y'all can't make it live. I you know, encourage everybody to go listen to it over there. Uh, you can't ask the guest questions live, but, you know, at least you don't have to miss it that way. Right. And I'll make sure that I share that link on my blog site and my webpage, and that way the fans will know how to find you, and they'll well, be able to tune in again. Right now, I've got three um, YouTube channels, because what I've done was I segregated the shows for uh, Talk Now Radio, which is my own stream, uh, has only the Talk Now Radio shows on it, uh, Revolution, uh, Talk Now Radio on Revolution Radio, which has nothing but the shows I do here on it, and then it has the other one that I'm not mentioning because I don't want to mention competition. But, you know, basically, the, anytime I, I do start up at a new network somewhere, I will create a new uh, network channel, and I will put that up on my website for anybody so they'll be able to find it. Cool. So... With you, we're about to run out of time. Have you got anything else you want to throw out there before I let you escape? <laughs> um, n not at the moment. I think we've pretty much covered all bases. Um, once again, if someone wants to check out my blog and, and maybe see if there's any local vampire legend in their neck of the woods, uh, that is uh, um, Author Lynn Gibbs WordPress, or they can go to my personal page at Author Lynn Gibbs com and there's a link and like we were talking about earlier there's a search bar at the top of the page so if they want to know what's the vampire legend and lore in new orleans they can type orleans into the search bar and it'll pull up all of the, the past blogs and they they can read that or maybe right there where they live because there there are a few more legends that that i have had found enough valid information on in the united states but not many um, not a whole lot. There were a few back in the Revenant era up north. Um, I believe there was one in Seattle, one in Alaska, which is not in the continental United States, one in Florida, and then everything else was basically Louisiana. So either other areas don't like to discuss their vampire legend or there just isn't a whole lot there to tell. But uh, there's definitely plenty, plenty places to look and check it out if they're curious about China or Iran or Turkey, which there's some vicious vampire legends over there in the Middle East and, and in that region. So pretty cool read if they're interested. Sounds good to me. And, of course, and of course um, there, there will be a blog later this afternoon about our interview, and there's always updates on upcoming events and releases and um, where they can find me online or on the radio or, you know, personal appearances, those kind of things. So it's pretty good to follow the site. And if they do have any questions, they can certainly inbox me. I'd be happy to answer questions. All righty. And real quick, like before they hit that music on us, uh, Terrell said... Um, and in as much as it is appointed for men to die once and after that the judgment. He's quoting the actual verse. He pulled it up for me, in other words. And I'm kind of glad he did because what I'm seeing here is in his paraphrase, is what I'll call it, he didn't actually present it the way that verse is, the way I perceive the verse. Because I don't perceive it as saying our purpose here is to be judged. Like, it is, like he said earlier, we are here to be judged. But rather... This is an event that is going to occur according to Paul in the book of Hebrews, um, you know, after we die. Doesn't necessarily mean that's what we are actually here for, though. You know, big difference between 
a thing that's going to happen and what you're actually here to do, in other words. Right, that's right. So my understanding is probably different than his understanding, just coming from that angle right there, which that's not really a bad thing. I mean, those kind of misunderstandings are really, it seems to me, like pretty common everywhere you go. Right, that's right. It's just a matter of perception. That's right, that's right. It's like we were saying earlier, you can read the whole Bible, you're going to get something out of it, I'm going to get something out of it, the chances with the same thing out of it, very slim. <laughs> we're, uh, and I think it is written that way on purpose, for, for us to read it and do our own research and find our own truth within those pages. And also, after he did uh, put down the exact quote, I do recognize it, I am very familiar, it's one of the most quoted ones that my family throws around the uh, Thanksgiving table. <laughs> ah. Well, like I said, my dad was a preacher. I used to teach Sunday school. Uh, I'm here in Houston, Texas, right in the middle of the Bible Belt. You can imagine I come from a whole family of Pentecostals. Mm-hmm. And with that, I hear the music interrupting us. Lynn, it's been a real pleasure. It's kind of like if you ask me, we've known each other for years here talking. And I think we I have know. just got to do this again. I agree. I, I thank you so much for having me on, and thank you, thank you for inviting me back. And also, I'm just excited that you are well again and healthy. So you just stay that way. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate that, everybody. I have not decided my guest for next Thursday yet. So show up Thursday, and you'll find out. I'll try to make the show my best. Y'all be good, and I'll be real. Bye, everybody. Bye, bye.